And we are live. Happy Thursday, everyone. I know for some of you, you're used to seeing these two faces on Friday, but don't be confused. We're not there yet. It's only Thursday. Um, <laughs> so close. <laughs> we are very excited to be here with you today. You're getting a double dose of me with Aida Mullenkamp, and I'm very excited to, to have the opportunity to see you twice this week. It's always a pleasure to at least see you once, but twice is just a thrill. Likewise, likewise. I'm yeah. very excited about this week because we're talking about one of my favorite things, which is starting to get into the appetizers. I probably would want to eat in like all apps if I could. I was going to ask you if you're like, if you're that kind of person, because I'm that way too, where I could make an entire meal out of nothing but apps. And um, yeah. I think, you know, with the ones that we've got right now, that's a pretty solid thing that we could do, right? I agree. There is basically a like little amuse bouche hors d'oeuvre and main course going on today so <laughs> we got it going on and with the wine too actually so yeah. i'm very excited yeah. about this got all of our bases covered and yeah. as you're thinking about holiday planning you can choose to use one all some a mix of everything um and sort of play around with it but really what we wanted to do today was give options more than anything and and just sort of outline an approach to what is going to certainly be a very interesting holiday season. Some people will be doing it um, in smaller groups. Some people are sticking with their norm and doing it with larger groups. And so I think um, you've done a wonderful job as always at, at bringing some recipes that can sort of have some uh, multifaceted strategies to approaching this holiday season, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I'm really looking forward to just like the mix that we can do, you know, because mm -hmm. what's really fun, especially here in November, what's really fun is that here in California, it's the end of avocado season. So I might've thrown an avocado in one of our dishes. <laughs> and then it's also the beginning of our winter produce, right? Like we have so many amazing greens that come from here. We have so many great um, citrus. And so I kind of tried to make you something that has a little bit of all of that. And I'm very excited about the wines you chose because just like these flavors, they're from all over and all kind of a mixed bag, but um, very, very delicious. Yeah, and a few like unexpected choices, I think, um, and unexpected things from California that we you know don't always think about being innately California, i.e. probably the first one we should start with, because I mean, I think you've gotten to know me pretty well by now and know that any excuse to eat caviar and oysters is a good one in my book, and I think you you gently like nudge me like hey like i see you asking for this a lot so like let's just incorporate it <laughs> like i got you <laughs> well here's the thing is and forgive me if i'm repeating myself but um one of the things that i think is so special so i as you know i come from a huge family and so our, our holidays are like 40 people minimum and it's really hard to in that context. I mean, we try to a little bit, but I think what's so special about this year is you can go with the flow. And if you're going to do a smaller group, mm -hmm. you can splurge. And so one of the first things we're doing is splurging with caviar because yes. it got requested. So this is our first, <laughs> first little bites. Yes. Um, How very beautiful. exciting. We've got the accoutrement. I do not, but that's just a combination of laziness and also we've got really delicious caviar so yeah we do um actually i'll get it out of the fridge if you want to introduce it and we can show it if that's yes cool. that was good timing me taking a bite um so we've got uh czar nikolai caviar which uh, yeah sorry about the light here but yeah. the reserva and it's very creamy salty the texture for me is everything you yeah. know caviar it's like it's definitely flavor but you know, it's wonderful that like creaminess sort of like blends perfectly into the the creme fraiche and the potato and you get just that hit of brightness. It was funny when I was making these potatoes, I was like, oh, I was like, I should sprinkle some like some more salt on this. And then I was like, oh, no, no more salt. <laughs> We've got that covered no. uh, on the other side. No. Of um, and so of no, no caviar, potato, salty uh, situation would be complete without a little sparkling wine. So yeah. I'm gonna open this if you wanna talk a little bit more about what we got. Sure, so um, just to clarify, um, everybody thinks Caspian Sea when they think of caviar, but if you eat caviar a lot, you probably realize there's been a big push in the last few decades in order to make it sustainable because it is something that can be quite sustainable when it comes to farming. And so Zarnikla is California. 
It is from Northern California. It's a collection of sturgeon farmers, so same fish that would be used over in Iran, over in Russia in the classic, classic styles, but extremely sustainable. Um, and one of the things that I think is really important just to remind everybody in case you haven't had caviar in a while you do not want to use any kind of metal with the row okay so if you order from czar nikolai actually a lot of caviar producers they will send you a mother of pearl or some kind of appropriate spoon and as as uh, amanda was saying this caviar is really delicious We're, we got their reserve which is the top of the top so you could completely just go like very traditional Russian style and eat it off the spoon, give every guest spoon and their own portion of caviar and bubbles. Russians would do vodka, obviously. Um, we didn't want to overwhelm it. So instead of blini, which are like the classic buckwheat pancakes, also because I wanted something gluten-free, we made um, smashed potatoes. And so it's a smashed potato, creme fraiche, a little bit of dill, a little bit of diced onion that as Amanda knows, I'm a fan of taking diced onion, putting it in ice water, and then it mellows out the flavor. And the whole idea here is we really want the caviar to sing so that the main flavor profile is the caviar and the bubbles. And everything else is just like, icing, but not icing that's overwhelming on the cake. Um, and in the recipe that we have on Salt and Wind, you could either boil these potatoes or boil them and then roast them. But as Amanda was saying, if you roast them, don't add too much saltiness. Don't add too much. <laughs> don't let them get super, super crispy. It's just to give them a little texture. Um, okay, so Amanda, you talk. I'm gonna have some caviar. Yeah, oh, please do. Um, yes, so I mean, I, I obviously I love caviar, but um, Caviar and champagne uh, is one of the things that we just, when I think of celebration, I think of holidays and I think of decadence, I always think of caviar and champagne. And so I love that we've, you know, sort of California eyed this as we always do um, and gotten caviar from California. And then of course, one of my favorite sparkling wine producers um, in California, this is Caraccioli from San Lucia Highlands, which we've talked about um, many times. I think thus far, we've had a few different examples. Um, yeah spend some time here, but I love the Santa Lucia Highlands. This is a place of, um, you know, you you go through, if you've ever driven through a SLH, um, you will notice a couple of different things. One, it's quite different than going through like Napa or Sonoma, um, maybe more so Napa, but like regions that are, you know, densely populated with vines. Uh, San Luis Islands isn't really that way. There's, it's, it's much more diverse with tons of different agriculture. So I think I've said this before, but like literally you'll see like grapevines, lemon trees, kale, artichoke, like all in, like if you're driving all in like your, your sight line, it's kind of crazy. And then they also have these crazy like peaks and valleys, um, and this wind that comes through. So lots of different elevations without having like mountain elevations but you know huge big exposure and then the coolness that comes in from uh from the pacific there makes it a really really ideal place for pinot noir and chardonnay so that's to some extent like the the most of what you're going to see in this region so of course it would be natural to have a sparkling wine uh from that region and a really really good one at that because they in addition to it being a you know a great place um because of all the different uh, soils and because of the, the way the wind's coming through. Um, they also have like a very, very long growing season, which means mm -hmm. you get a long time for those grapes to ripen. And as we talked about Pinot and Chard before, we want all those gorgeous flavors to develop. And, and when you're talking about sparkling wine, in order to make sparkling wine in, in the champagne method, which is that secondary fermentation, um, you do have to harvest a little bit early. You want, you want to harvest at a slightly lower bricks. Reason being, you're going to add a little bit more later on so you want to come in a little bit under which means you need those grapes to have a lot of flavor development before the sugars get there um, which makes this region really really wonderful for sparkling wine not to get super super geeky but um you know i think it is one of those reasons that i just love this so much and this is uh, a vintage designate um and yeah. we've got a 2012 i just got a 2013 um i you know i will mention like this is readily available online you can you can definitely buy um these vintage wines and they're not terribly expensive um and they're so delicious and bright uh this is pinot noir and chardonnay uh coming from slh and of course you know the brightness and the zestiness and the zippiness yeah. 
gorgeously with all of the intensity and the the texture and the um, the decadence that is on this little this little potato bite, which packs a serious punch and is going to be gone in about twenty seconds. So well, so it's interesting because you have that like Chardonnay Pinot Noir classic classic champagne pairing or combo, and mm -hmm. so you're getting that citrus in like some of those green, but you, I, I'm not getting that brioche-ness that you yeah. like so associate. And I have to say, I prefer that clean, like slightly leaner to go with something like this. Cause again, like not well wanting to overwhelm the caviar itself. And this is actually a more delicate caviar in terms of flavor. It's not as mm -hmm. intense as some of the like most prized caviars that come from um, Eastern Europe and, and Asia. And so I think that's all that much more important to mm -hmm. be doing the pairing of a style of wine like this, which yeah. I haven't had the actual pairing. So excuse me. Yes, no, please do. And you brought up a great point. I think, you know, one of the things that is so special about San Jose Highlands is the Chardonnays tend to take on like a really intense lemon characteristic. And mm. so you're right, they don't get, like I was saying, you're not getting a lot of ripeness. Um, you're getting all the phenolic ripeness, but you're not getting those intense flavors that come with a hotter, more intense climate where you're like really having to wait for those sugars to develop to make a proper wine. And so you don't have that here, which means you get much more of that champagne feel. You know, champagne's super cold, you know, really chalky, minerally soils. Um, here, you're not getting chalky soils, but you're getting a lot of the same thing. It's not cold, but it's cooler, it's, it's elongated. And so a lot of the things that you would expect from a leaner, brighter, zestier champagne you're getting um, a lot with uh, with this Caraccioli. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm very you, into this. You have a question, if you don't mind, and hopefully yes, um, of course. you don't, uh, maybe this is something you can answer, but there's a question about the taste difference between uh, a reserve caviar and another caviar, and maybe we can even dive into some of the, the like, what to look for, because, you know, the other night I had, like, Ossetra caviar, Um I, that was super casual. I did not mean to be as casual about the fact that I had Ocetra the other night. Um, I was very lucky to have Ocetra, but it is quite different. Um, and maybe to your point earlier, not quite as intense uh, and like mm -hmm. um, saltwatery like, but like, can you dive into maybe what the difference would be? So a lot of the difference, oh, there you go. Sorry. A lot of the difference that you're going to come across with caviar is going to be the fish and then obviously there's like a little influence of the terroir so there's going to be the amount of salinity in the place that the fish is raised and all of those things um, but a lot of it comes down to so if i just want to make sure everybody goes and googles what a sturgeon looks like because if a dinosaur could swim it would be a sturgeon <laughs> and it actually happens to be one of the oldest and largest fish in existence mm -hmm. and it takes ever i mean years for them to come to maturity to get their eggs and what have you. And one sturgeon will give you, I mean, tons, thousands and thousands of eggs. And so you will even see differences from sturgeon to sturgeon, not only in the strain, the type of sturgeon it is, but also where it grew up and its diet. And then of course, the age of the sturgeon when it when it is harvested. And, um, and the thing about something like this reserve, this is actually, um, where did I put it? This is actually a style of sturgeon that they have found. It's an American sturgeon that they're using at um, Tsar Nikolai. So this is not the same kind that you would have for a Cetra. This is not the same kind you would have for Beluga. And so a big difference there is going to come down to the sturgeon itself. And always because of the tradition of Tsars being involved with all the Russian um, sturgeon, those are always kind of considered the most prized, mm -hmm. but actually kind of similar to champagne. Like there's a huge history and a huge uh, barrier to entry to be, you know, a quality champagne. At the same time, that doesn't mean other places don't have really, really good quality things that are in the same vein. And that's what's going on with this American caviar. Mm -hmm. um, this is rich and it has salinity, but it's not the same salinity. I don't know if you are noticing, I know you had the Ocetra a while ago, mm -hmm. but I don't know if you're noticing the difference, but Ocetra can be like pretty salty very, and very this salty. is more subtle. Um, and then, you know, at that, I really, really encourage you to either get a set from one caviar producer, um, be it Tsar Nikolai or somebody else, or even some of the great caviar restaurants in the world will do a prefix multi-course tasting. I didn't really understand how different caviars taste until mm -hmm. I sat down with one person 
and went through that. And just to put this out there, last thing I'll say is that there are essentially caviar sommeliers. And so there's so much nuance here that there are people who are so specialized, they literally travel around the world tasting the latest harvest of caviar. So I'm giving you what I know, but really there are other experts who know much, much more. I love that. I I feel like this should be my next job as a caviar sommelier. You're destined. <laughs> I'm destined. <laughs> Well, I love this. And I think, um, you know, for that little like pop of decadence during the holidays, this is a perfect way to do it. And, you know, I think it, caviar is not cheap. It's, you know, it's it's a different, it's like any great thing in the, on the planet. You know, the best things are, are generally not inexpensive, but, you know, you only use a tiny little amount uh, and it's a great way to like feel kind of splurgy and like make it go around, especially if you've got groups or if you've got a smaller amount that you just want to like hang out, there's nothing that says like, I have arrived when someone sets down caviar and you're like, all right, like that's the thing you remember, at least for me, like my best nights are like, what did you have last night? I was like, I don't know, but I had a lot of caviar and it was great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think again, like not only are, if we're having smaller groups, then if we're okay spending the same budget, we can do more for yeah. that smaller group that we did last year. Also, um, and this kind of segues us, if that's okay with you, into Perfect. this next yeah. appetizer. Um, also, one of the things that I'm really focused on is we can't, I mean, yes, we can go to restaurants depending on where you live. Most of us are not going to restaurants. Yes. Most of us are not getting white tablecloth, fine dining experiences. So there's small ways to up the ante in your mm -hmm. home. One of them is caviar. You could literally buy store-bought blinis and serve it with creme fraiche and that's all you have to do. Or like I said, the spoons and the caviar and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. Another one that I'm going to propose, which I don't know if Amanda feels like this is a little bit of a curveball, uh -huh. is to yeah. make is to make a crudo. And that's because if you have access to high quality seafood, then it does it all for you. And making this is seriously less than 10 minutes to put this together. So this is going to go with a very, I'm very excited about this wine pairing because I think it's like absolutely perfect. So it's just to give you guys an overview. What this is, is California as it comes. So it's smashed avocado on a plate that's kind of like guacamole, but not quite. And then we thinly sliced day scall or bay scallops. And then there's radish, jalapeno, orange, lime. And that's what you toss the um, scallops in. And then I absolutely insist you use a high quality fruity uh, California olive oil. So not one of those olive oils we've talked about in the past that mm -hmm. has like the gazzagola and all the phenols in it, but something that's subtle because this Sauvignon Blanc that, that you are pairing it with is so, so much is going on this Sauvignon Blanc. This is like a Sauvignon Blanc that's like, hello, did you not, did you not pay attention to Sauvignon Blanc? Cause I'm here. And as a result, you want this crudo. It has a lot of flavor but it doesn't have a ton of anything. I feel, I hope you feel that way, Amanda. I tried not to put too much. There's ginger, there's jalapeno, there's lime, but not too much of anything so that when you pair it with the wine, it's complimenting it and not, yes. you know, freaking out the wine. No, I, I think you um, you hit the nail on the head perfectly. And I, I just want to clarify, you said bay scallop or day boat scallop? No, sorry, day boat scallop. I meant, I said bay, okay. I meant day boat. I'm okay. like, thank you very much. So yeah, bay yeah. scallops are the itty bitty guys that, you know, you get on the East Coast. Um, yeah. I've never really enjoyed those. I'm I'm sorry. No, I'm not so into them either. I and I have to tell you, I was I was having um I was having a moment on Saturday. Uh, it was Halloween, and I was like, you know, I'm just like kind of bummed. Like Halloween isn't really happening. And so, to your point earlier, you know, we don't have a lot of opportunities for decadence this, hol this holiday season, and I guess to some degree, I include Halloween in that. Um, but I I was like, you know, I just like need a little like something fun, and so I went to Whole Foods. Um, in Napa and they had these beautiful day boat scallops and oysters and I was like you know what I am going to splurge and I have to tell you for one person it wasn't that much it was like yeah. dollar oysters and the day boat scallops and it was like you know 20 bucks which you know on a Friday night like by yourself you know probably less than me ordering food from like seamless um, yeah but a really good way to feel a little bit splurgy and uh, I think you know that is sort of the theme for me this season is like, I don't yeah. have 
the opportunity to be going out a lot. And so I'm trying to find little ways to small splurges. Yeah, because I think, you know, for me and I'm sure for you too, like going out to eat, you know, food, wine, these are these are comfort things for me. And I think for a lot of people, yeah. I think that's not to be ignored this holiday season as you're you're spending a little bit more time indoors and a little bit more time at your home. Um, don't just count the fact that like those things really make you feel good. Um, and so many times, you know, this is about the flavors and it's about the pairings, but this is also about like emotion and a feeling and, and food yeah. can often, you know, bring you a lot of joy in ways that you kind of didn't really expect. And I just totally. tell that story because it really did sort of brighten my day as I was like, Halloween was setting in and I was like, you know, I'm not really doing anything this year. <laughs> well, and if I can just say one thing about buying fish for crudo, um, you need it to be uber, 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 uber fresh. So make sure you go to somebody you trust, tell them that you are going to, if, whether it's sushi, whether it's crudo, whatever it is, even ceviche, tell them that it's going to be used for that so that they give you the absolute freshest. And in terms of splurging, this can be made for, I would say this is a portion for like two to four people, depending on how many other apps you have going on. And this can be made with as few as four scallops because you actually slice them into like really thin coins. Uh, because you don't want to eat a whole scallop. It's actually, when you toss it the marinade, it won't really grab onto the marinade. If it's one big scallop the way it will, you have like, you know, better surface area to marinade if you have thinner, thinner scallop pieces. So and this is a splurge, but it's also not really a splurge because if you got eight scallops, you could basically make this for like 12 people. So yeah, it's a stealthy splurge, which we stealthy like. Stealthy splurge. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so crudo in general, you know, whenever you're talking about crudo, you're thinking about light, bright flavors because you're generally talking about citrus um, or some, you know, iteration there. And so we definitely got the citrus, but I think because it is a scallop crudo, which tends to be, you know, a little bit, scallops are sweet. You know, they've got a yeah. brightness to them. They've got a depth to them. They've got a textural component. And then you add the avocado, which is nice, nice and creamy. Um, you know, as we talked about, Sauvignon Blanc can really run the gamut. It's it's truly a grape that, depending on where it's grown, can go from like really bright and like almost, you know, more in the, like the green side of things to something like what we have here, which is a little bit riper, um, a little brighter um, as far as like the profile goes. And then, you know, it's got a little bit more texture. And I actually, I yeah. don't have this super, super cold. And one of the reasons I like this is, you know, traditionally when you cook a scallop, um, scallops really want something like Chardonnay. So whether that's yeah. a Chardonnay, um, you know, it's still wine or a Chardonnay uh, that's been turned into a sparkling wine, like this would also be very, very delicious yeah. um, with this crudo. And then if, you know, additionally, if you wanted to cook those scallops would be delicious as well. But, you know, for me, sometimes uh, scallop crudo doesn't really love a Sauvignon Blanc so much because, yeah. you know, it can be a little bit too bright, but I love... Uh, this is coming from Paso. Uh, it's technically a California designate, so it's coming from a few different places. But, um, you know, this is a, a slightly riper area. And so the Sauvignon Blanc, for that reason, has a little bit more richness and a little bit more depth. And so for people um, that, you know, typically gravitate towards Chardonnays, uh, I think this sort of bridges that gap for them. And then it also yeah. bridges the gap for the dish. Um, and then, you know, you also have to think about that jalapeno. Anytime you've got jalapeno or pepper, you're talking about pyrazine. You're talking about that, yeah. that green compound. Um, and the grapes that have the pyrazine compound are going to be Sauvignon Blanc and the Cabernet family. So Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc. Um, so if you've got green bell pepper going on like the red spectrum, you're going to want to go those grapes. If you've got green bell pepper going on the white spectrum, you're definitely going to want to look at things like Sauvignon Blanc, which sort of highlight that. Um, and to your point, because the, because the green pepper, because the jalapeno isn't super uh, prevalent, it's not uh, prominent in the dish, um, and because you've got a lot of other things and it's more of a subtle flavor, this is uh, a Sauvignon Blanc that has the pyrazine compound, and pyrazine is P-Y-R-A-Z-I. And E for those of you who are like, what the heck are you talking about? Um, you know, sometimes when we talk about these wines, they have this sort of like greenness to them. That that is the pyrazine compound that exists just naturally. And so the riper the wine, the tip, the more likely you are to sort of lose that more herbaceous character. Uh, you know, and certainly you have sort of the Sauvignon Blanc, but it's under there, sort of in the way that that green bell pepper is underneath of that scallop dish. Um, I don't have the scallop in front of me, but I am imagining in my head how delicious this all is. I looked at all the ingredients and I was like, 
this would be really delicious. But I'm really only one person, so I probably shouldn't make all this food. <laughs> that wouldn't be yeah. very sustainable in California as me. Yes, no, it wouldn't be. Um, so yeah, the the other thing about this dish is if you don't want to make it with the avocado, you can totally take that out. And then you can use it with whatever fish is freshest at your mm -hmm. fish longer. Um, I kind of would naturally want to put this with Santa Barbara spotted prawns because mm -hmm. they're freaking delicious, but they are sweeter. So what kind of wine would you, would you still go toward this or something else if that were the case? Um, yeah, I mean, you could still go for a Sauvignon Blanc. You might go like the Pinot Gris family or the Verbiaginer family, um, uh, grapes that tend to have a little bit more um, of that like uh, Im implied or perceived sweetness, you know, that mm -hmm. aren't necessarily. Um, and then Riesling, you know, always, yeah. always a good bet for- or Something uh, medium, a little medium sweet and like- yeah. yeah, and you know, they don't even have to have any sort of like actual sugar, but just that feeling of sweetness. Um, Cause what you don't want to do is overwhelm this Crudo dish and they can get very, very overwhelmed. I mean, traditionally yeah. we're talking about Crudo, um, you know, whether that's in, uh, in Spain or in Peru or, you know, wherever you are, it's ceviche, crudo, um, you know, typically you're talking about the lighter varieties that are pairing with that. Yeah. So Albarino, yeah. Pinot Grigio, um, you know, Chocolate yeah. if you're in Spain, um, you know, Verde, you know, these really light sort of almost watery, so, you yes. know, have a lot of salinity and brightness to them, zesty. Um, but I think the second you start to put scallop in the mix, that's when it starts to want a little bit more texture and a little bit more yeah. meat. And to your point, spotted prawns, I love them, but they definitely are gonna want something that's a little bit more intense. And you could definitely still go with, um, some. there's some wonderful Aburinos from California. Um, you know, yeah. There's not a ton of it planted, but there are some great examples of it. Um, and that would be delicious with it as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean that, so this dish is actually inspired by, there's this restaurant in San Francisco, it's been around for years since I lived there called Perbaco. Okay. And the crew who originally started that restaurant are from Northern Italy. And so when I lived in San Francisco, not many people were doing crudo that was kind of like high end. There was tons of good ceviche, but not crudo. And so this is not their dish by any means, but it's just kind of like very, very loosely inspired by it. Um, and I, and, I, the, the Pinot Grigio is exactly what I come to is like, I always think about, even though those guys are from Piedmont, the closest ocean area is going to be Liguria and the coast there. And it has that Pinot Grigio that's like, you know, has a little bit of salinity going mm -hmm. on in it. And that's something that I think we do so well in California too, is that we have these whites that like have this beautiful little salinity where you're like, Ooh, there's just this other little something in it. I love having it with dishes like this. So Yes, but this Desperata is a very interesting wine. Um, yes. I know our friend Casey is a huge fan of it. Yes, um, and frankly, so she totally introduced me to this, and I want to like draw attention to the label, which is so beautiful, beautiful. and I think representative of um, the owner. So this is a female. This is a female-founded, owned, run project down in Paso. Um, I read that she speaks twelve languages fluently, and is like a woman of the world. So she's definitely like right up my alley. Um, and it does, yeah, it does show you. I love. I love labels that like actually give you some great information. So, I know this is good. Um, it shows you all this. Sorry, it's really hard to see the slide, but it shows you all the vineyards. It shows you um, how many cases were made. You know specifically what the variety is, and then it gives you like a little bit. Um, uh, well, actually, not on this one. I thought I gave you the story, but yeah, you can get the story um, on the website. And I just I think it's you know it's a beautiful, beautiful label and um, such a fun wine and. A great expression of Sauvignon Blanc, which I think, you know, so many times Sauvignon, I love Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, actually, that's a lie. I don't love Sauvignon Blanc. I love good Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and I think so many times, I think I don't always love it because it seems like an afterthought sometimes uh, and seems like a great that's just like, all right, like we'll make it to make some money and like doesn't, doesn't like have a lot of thought put into it. And this definitely does. I mean, there is a clear expression of what they're trying to get across with this wine. Yeah. Super, yeah, super. And, and and it's frustrating. I agree with you on Sauvignon Blanc that it kind of gets sometimes thrown aside as yeah. in terms of attention. And it is frustrating. Um, when I went to culinary school, I lived down the street from a restaurant that was like, all they did was Sancerre food and Sancerre, like Loire food and Loire wine. So it was mm -hmm. like literally only Sancerre on this menu. <laughs> and that was my first real, I was like 21 or something. So that was my first real introduction to Sauvignon Blanc. Mm -hmm. And I do remember coming back home and being like, wait, there's so many amazing wines from this region <laughs> and this cold climate expression of Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah. 
And granted, that's years ago, and people have really upped the ante with it. But um, it is a very commercial um, grape, so I think you know you you do have to know the ones you love, and this is one we love. So. Yeah, and you know, God bless Sancerre for bringing Sauvignon Blanc to the. I I think that's that Sancerre craze is definitely what you know moved us all in the right direction of loving Sauvignon Blanc and. It getting better here in the United States. And for those who yeah. don't know this, Sancerre is a region in the Loire Valley that is famous for making Sauvignon Blanc. And if you order a Sancerre and you just say Sancerre, you're going to get a Sauvignon Blanc. Um, there is Sancerre Rouge, but you know, Sauvignon Blanc is power in, in the Loire Valley. And so you yeah. know, in the United States, we don't have to, we don't call our wines by the regions, we just call them by the grape. Um, so it's just called Sauvignon Blanc here. So yeah. super tasty. I love that uh, Casey brought this to our attention and what a yeah. Fun, Thank fun you, Casey. To try, yeah. So we've done San Lucia Highlands, we've done Paso, and now, yes. and now we're going to Sonoma. Um, I am so excited to get to talk about this producer. This, I have really great memories of this wine because um, years ago, actually, probably not that long ago, just seems that long ago. Um, Andy Pay came to taste us um, on his entire lineup of wines at Press, which was, of course is a uh, as a Napa Valley wine list. And I felt terrible because I was like, Andy, I'm so sorry. You know, like we only sell Napa wine. Yeah. <laughs> and then by the end of it, I was like, you know, we could like sneak a few in, like no one would know except for me. Um, so we did. So we ended up bringing on like three or four SKUs of, of pay, which is family owned and operated. So it's Andy and his brother, Nick and Nick's wife. Um, they, you know, own and operate it. Uh, Nick is a winemaker. Andy sort of like does all the things. Uh, he's a former, I think he was a sommelier, but um, former wine industry guy um, mm -hmm. that now focuses solely on this. And they do a beautiful, beautiful job with all of their grapes, the Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Syrah. I think they actually do a Sauvignon Blanc. Um, but Chardonnay, Pinot, and Syrah is really what we're known for here. Um, you know, we're talking about Sonoma Coast and we're talking about Syrah in the same sentence, which, you know, to me always is is like indicative of giant, big aromatics, which I don't know yeah. if you stuck your nose in the glass, but wow. Like yeah. big, but like, you know, I think of Syrah and like a lot of times, and we'll get into this dish, you know, you think of Syrah and you're like, you know, roasted meats or charcuterie. Sometimes you get a little of that like, rubber tire thing, which isn't so yeah. appetizing, but, um, you know, lots of different expressions. And I think this is, you know, this is definitely Californian, but because, because of where this sits and because of the ocean and wind influence, you do get a little bit more of this like old worldliness quality. So it's not mm -hmm. quite Cote Roti, Cornas, yeah. um, it's also not totally like Santa Barbara Syrah, uh, like Santa Quanon and Dremelly style, where it's a little bit more opulent. This is yeah. definitely sitting in the middle somewhere. And the second I saw um, shawarma, you know, whether it be, you know, chicken, lamb, whatever, I was like, Syrah, it has to be Syrah. <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely. So I have, um, I have made the chicken and I have made the harissa sauce, but I have foregone the pita situation because camera, face, not pretty at the same time. <laughs> um, so know. yeah, I'll just introduce this really quickly. We just wanted to make mini, mini shawarma. So if you can find little mini pita, then you can just make them um, open like Pac-Man style, or you can just take a lot of pita or kind of perforate it in half. And that's all this is, is like a half a pita. Mm -hmm. um, it is chicken shawarma. So uh, I insist, insist, insist to use chicken thighs because yeah. as you all know, a shawarma is a dish that is actually cooked on a vertical spit. Um, it's essentially the precursor to El Pastor, FYI. Yeah. Um, and it recently. has a lot of it has a lot of spices. I didn't want to put as many spices in this as you would traditionally use these white pepper, allspice stuff that we don't always have in our pantry, depending on how what you cook. Um, but there is a little bit of spice. It is a yogurt marinade, so you do have this extra um, this extra juiciness that's going to come from a marinade like that. That's if you think about buttermilk marinated ch fried chicken, it's that same mm. idea that you're going to bring in a little acid that's going to break down the chicken and going to make it more tender. And if you use thighs, it's going to make it especially tender. You can totally do it the way Amanda did. I, I would say if you were having a party, if you have a cup like yay size or even a little bigger, you could make like individual little portions, like a little shawarma bowl. Um, and then there are two sauces. Uh, I did did 
include the very traditional Lebanese sauce, which is, you can't even see it, tomb, which is essentially like their answer to aioli. It's so much garlic. So I, it was for the all the garlic and I could no. not do that to my family. No, no, no. So for the purposes <laughs> of a cocktail party, I would not serve it with a tomb. So I'm not even like bringing that, I'm just showing you it exists. The recipe is on our site, but don't make that for a cocktail party because everything else will be blown away, not only in terms of the food, but also in terms of the wine. So instead we have a very basic, again, blown out, sorry, um, yogurt sauce that has like a little yogurt, a little dill, a little tahini. So it's almost like a light tzatziki type yeah. of situation going on. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, you know, here in California, we always keep things a little lighter. So it's with chicken, there's a lot of veg in here. Um, and yet it still has the spice that you want to match up with that Syrah, right? Yeah. So I think, you know, we've talked about like, you know, colors sort of going together. Whenever you've got yeah. lighter proteins, whiter proteins, you're going to gravitate towards like lighter colored wines. Yeah. I think, you know, once you start moving into the direction of like, you know, getting a little bit more of a char or a grill, um, and then also adding all of this, you know, yogurt has a ton of acidity. Yeah. So you're talking about acid and you're talking about texture, and then you're talking about like depth of flavor. Um, I think that's when you can start to up the ante a little bit and move into red wine territory. And that's why I love Syrah with this. And you think of like shawarma, you think of um, slow roasted things like you want to maybe you think of hearty, you think of like, yeah. you know, things that are going to be a little bit more intense, both structurally and on your palate, which is why we went to Syrah. And again, you know, I think when you're thinking about, you know, which red wines to pair with this, still keep it light. Don't go heavy. Yeah. Some Syrahs can be a little bit more on the heavy side, but this is not. This yeah, is this a is quite light body. Syrah. Yeah. Um, and I love it. I love pay for that reason because, you know, all of their wines have such a great, strong sense of place. Mm -hmm. But then they also, you know, they keep it light. There isn't tons of extraction. And I think Syrah is a really easy grape to overdo and to over manipulate. Um, and sometimes we love that. Like I had a gorgeous bottle of uh, Sine Con on the other night and it was huge and massive, but like it really was kind of yeah, right? important. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like I drank it and I was like, I was going to order food, but like now I feel like I'm okay. Like this is, this is like a meal. A meal and no. Oh, <laughs> um, and someone is asking if it's, uh, it's a great question. Is it La, La Bruma or the Lay Titans? And this is La Bruma. Um, yeah. again, I'm sorry, these are a little bit uh, blown out, but this is 2015 La Bruma. Do you have 2015? Is that what you've got over there? I have 2017. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. I'm so in, I'm in the future on the wines today. I'm in 2013 and 17. <laughs> And 12 and, and I wasn't sure because we, we, our wines got sent to different places and not you know the vintages aren't always the same um yeah you no know, I think either way like pay you know pay is vintage specific but stylistically you're never going to be in a situation where like you know a hotter vintage like 17 um you're not going to be in a situation where it's you know big and opulent like they're no. always going to be pretty even keeled mm. um and I you know I just love them so much they've got these like crazy marine soils and if you've ever seen um there's scallop shell pinot noir and like it's literally like there's like scallop shell um like crustaceans like in their actual soil and so yeah i don't know if it's you know we, we talk about all the time like is it confirmation bias that we know like the stuff is in the soil like that leads us to think that maybe it you know ends up in the wine but like there is a real sense of minerality and a sense of place and um yeah. these wines are really unlike anything else um and Sonoma Coast, you know, I, I just love them so much. And they do such a great job of like, you know, keeping a lot of brightness and keeping a lot of uh, lift without losing depth yeah. of flavor, which is really hard to do. And I think, um, and and not to like, you know, totally uh, put you on the spot and, 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 and embarrass you, but uh, this is exactly what this dish is. Like, you know, it's a dish that could, you feels like you could totally get blown out with all of this stuff going on. And it, it but it, yet it seems so light and you take a bite of it and you're like, Oh, that's like actually like really light and easy. And you know, even yeah. though this like depth of flavor, it doesn't feel overwhelming and like you don't want to take another bite of it. Yeah. I mean, my Lebanese brother in law would be a little upset with me that I don't have it like super spiced out the way that he grew <laughs> up eating it. And I do make it for him with tons of especially white pepper um, and lots and lots of coriander. Here we have coriander in a teeny bit, um, a, a good amount of it still. And the thing for me is I think sometimes, so I absolutely adore Middle Eastern food. Mm -hmm. um, and as we've said in the past, like there's amazing wine from that region. Um, 
But I found that when I've traveled in that region, people are like big flavor with their food and big flavor wines. And I've always been a personal, personally have gravitated more toward like fruit, a little low tannin and a little lighter body. And I, I think everybody ends up a little happier, but I, I think it's also because to your point, when I cook this style of food, I tend to like pull back the rain. So this mm -hmm. isn't New York Fifth Avenue, like shawarma off of the street vendor where it's like super, super spicy. This is something that's just like a little bit lighter because if you're gonna eat the way we said we should always eat, which is in a bunch of small bites, you do want to accommodate all these different flavors because somebody might not eat in the order we showed you these dishes, they might come back to the crudo or back to the caviar and you don't want them so blown out that they basically get palate fatigue and like nothing tastes like anything anymore. <laughs> yes, no, I, I love that you said that. I mean, palate fatigue is a very real thing. And um, I also love that you're just so mindful of that, like as a host throughout the, the season and throughout you know life in general, like being aware of how different flavors are gonna interact with each other and not, you know, even though it's traditional to use the, the is it tomb, T, T, T O U? Oh, like tomb, tomb is what this is, yeah. Yeah, and not, so not to use that, use the, the um, tahini uh, instead. Yogurt, yeah. Make sure these flavors, you know, are, they don't have to be the same, but make them cohesive. Make sure that you're, you're not putting your guests in a situation where they're like, I can't eat anything else for the rest of the night. Yeah. Um, and, you know, same with your wines. You know, I think these are three different wines that you could definitely serve together, apart. Um, you could pick one. Uh, but I think, you know, if I'm, if I had to like make a pick, obviously sparkling is going to be the wine that takes you through all of these. Yeah. Um, and yeah. it's just such a great, you know, sparkling through the holidays. I'll be talking a lot about this. Um, you know, whether it's a, a white sparkling or a rosé sparkling, it is a great way to feel very celebratory, but also they're just such great food pairing wines. They have yeah. great acidity and, um, you know, especially with something that's been aged as long as like a 2012, it's got a little bit more texture, even though it's yeah. really bright and lifted, you know, that, that sparkling carry uh, Caracciole can really stand up to the shawarma and can stand up to the scallop crudo. You'd be totally fine to take that all the way through. So don't feel like, you know, even though we're talking about Syrah going with the shawarma, like if you were serving this just for dinner, yeah, like do the Syrah with it, but don't feel like you need to have everything and please everyone and have every perfect yeah. dish pair with every perfect wine. Cause that's just, it's overwhelming, not only for you as the host, but it's overwhelming as the guest. Like, oh, uh, sorry, like, did I have the wrong bite with the wrong wine? Like. You yeah, know, people really feel that way sometimes and they get overwhelmed and this is just supposed to be about snacking, which is my favorite thing in the world. Yeah, I mean, we, so we host a, um, so we make an aged eggnog every single year and then we host a party when the eggnog what? is ready. Aged eggnog. So I you have want, never heard of this. So if you want the recipe on Salt and Wind, um, we make it on Thanksgiving and serve it in the period between Christmas and New Year's. Um, and that is a really bold alcoholic um, drink, obviously. And so we almost treat it like the dessert for the party. And then we serve sparkling, sparkling, sparkling the whole time. And I do a big spread. And the other thing I will say about when you're entertaining like this, be totally, it's totally cool to make stuff ahead of time, like the palmiers we made in Instagram Live last week, something like that. You make it ahead of time, sorry. Um, and freeze it so that mm -hmm. you don't have that much work to do, or totally okay to buy, to do store bought. We're going to show you an oyster topping in a couple weeks mm -hmm. that that way you get the oysters. All you have to do is make the mignonette, that's it. So just like give yourself a break. Um, holiday entertaining is way more fun when the host is having fun and yes. keep that in mind. Um, but so anyway, every time that we serve this, when I first started doing the eggnog party, my husband was like, I don't know, I want beer and I want this and I want that. And I'm like, you're not gonna make it to the eggnog. You're not gonna make it. You have all the bites, in, but like if you treat it like dessert and you have the sparkly. And so now, just yesterday, he was like, how many bottles of the California sparkly? Six, six? okay, good to know. And so he ordered yeah. it. So it's on its way, our good California. Oh, good. Yeah. I'm so glad that the sparkly we'll be using in a couple of weeks. So. I love that, how fun, yeah. This our oysters are sparkling. There's so many great ones. We talked about a few already. We'll we'll yeah. definitely finish up with some uh, California sparkling at the end of all this. Uh, our very final IG live after um, after Thanksgiving. But there's some great ones out there, and like you know, they all do different things. I think you know, you think of champagne, and champagne is wonderful. But like you know, I think in the state of California, you have a lot more diversity and versatility yeah. with sparkling wine, and 
And you know, this is really this crash really was really great for what we were having today. But like when we move into the oysters, uh, and I won't say what the topping is, but with this particular topping, it's going to be better with like a pink sparkling. Um, yeah, I am very excited to have that. And and I think you know whatever it is, if it's you know sparkling of any kind, most people are going to be just fine with that. Yeah, um, I I think you're right. Like a happy host makes for a much more pleasant and enjoyable evening. So you know, give yourself a break. Don't go crazy. Those palmiers, yeah. I I spent a whole week eating those <laughs> palmiers and that's such a great, I mean, we didn't include it this time because we talked about it last week, but yeah. they are so good and so easy and like the perfect, I whipped it out. I had a friend over for dinner on Sunday night and, you know, I was still kind of making dinner and I was like, are you hungry now? And she was like, yeah, I could eat. And I was like, great. So I whipped out my palmiers. I grabbed like four, put them on a tray, put them in the oven. And like, you know, 20 minutes later, there they were. Um, and she was like, oh my gosh, did you just like make these? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I did. I love um, it. It, was like, it was so great. And I, I think I posted about it after just because it was one of those things where I was like, if you're, you know, prepared and you know what's going on. And like, I've been practicing all my recipes that you yeah. so wonderfully put together and like, I feel like I'm ready to go for the holidays and like, you know, at the end of the day, people are going to be excited to eat whatever you put in front of them. So yeah, give yourself a break. Um, yeah. and, and the other thing is we've, we've mentioned this a few times. Uh, we talked about it last week, holiday entertaining. Do not feel like you need to use stems. Um, they do not fit in the dishwasher comfortably. Um, and you do not want to be washing more than two glasses. I promise you it's really annoying. You have to try yeah. them. Um, so do yourself a favor, get a few of the tumblers, um, and and use those for the holidays, especially if you got more than like you know four or five people, it's much easier. And again, like even sparkling wine and a little tumbler is like delicious and fine. Just yeah. make sure you get like a tiny bit more of a chill on it because uh, you're going to be holding that glass like that, and it's going to get a little bit warmer faster. You know when I um, so I, I sorry I like repeating myself because we've no. I feel like we're dating <laughs> and I'm like I'm telling you a story from our first date. Um, but when, when, for those of you who haven't watched every week of Instagram live that we've been doing, um, so I come from, a, my stepmother is French and when she first came to the United States, she's from Northern France near Champagne, things are pretty formal up there. And when she moved here, something I'll never forget is like, she started entertaining and it would be like a charger and a plate and da, 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 and all this stuff. And then finally she kind of like cracked open how to entertain <laughs> California style. And she realized she was like, oh, you put the effort on things that matter. So like quality music, quality wine, yeah. quality ingredients, and then you just like let it flow. And I think that is something, um, you know, I, part of my job is also being a travel planner. And whenever people want to come to California, they're always like, you know, I want that like energy, that like relaxed lifestyle. And and honestly, that's how you should entertain where it's not, don't need to get the silver out. Yeah. Sorry, grandma, don't need those things anymore. You can just no. be chill about it. No, Californians are super chill. And I definitely learned that when I moved to California and I, I think I've told this before too, like the discovery of butter and eggs in California was a, a revelatory experience because it changed everything. And I think, you know, the second you start to understand just what quality ingredients can do for you and like, you know, it really brings down the level of uh, education and effort that you need on your side when it comes to cooking. Yeah. One of the things that I've loved about your recipes is that you stress more than anything. Like this is not about technique. This is about ingredients. And so yeah. you'll find the best things you can and the, the rest will follow suit. And this is sort of the way that I've been learning to cook over the past few years. You just put a little bit more refinement and like um, more of a discipline to it so that I'm not, you know, overcooking things and things aren't over salted and I'm not doing, not, you know, over boiling something when I should have been roasting it instead. Um, and these, these recipes have all been, you know, very innately Californian in that way. Um, you know, present company, uh, not excluded. So I, I love you for that. And I love salt and these have Thank all you. been like, so perfect for the holidays. And I'm so excited to show my like Pennsylvania family, all the wonderful things that California can do. Um, and can I just say one more California thing? Because that yeah. is why we all here after yeah. all. Is I do want to say that I, I know we've, we've talked about how we both love Thanksgiving traditions, but it's also totally fair game this year to kind of break a lot of those traditions mm -hmm. as long as nobody's going to be like, you, know, you don't take away so-and-so's favorite dish of the night or something. Um, but 
what I do want to just remind everybody is everything that's coming into season right now. So we have awesome apples from California, as you all saw if you joined us for our apple hand pies. Um, but also we have like great hard winter squash that comes from here. One of my absolute favorites though is the persimmons. So depending on where you are, you may or may not be able to get access to our California persimmons. They're absolutely delicious on um, a cheese plate, which may be something, may be something we're talking about in the future. Um, and then of course, I already talked about with the crudo, but the citrus. And so if you live in one of these places, like my grandmother's from the Ohio Valley where the minute it snows, it's just like, you're not gonna see anything but snow until May 1st. If you live in a place like that, still try to go hunt out that California produce that brings that sunshine into your meal because even just like some great kumquats or again, mm -hmm. if you can find, you know, some of these bright lettuces that we have or greens or any of that, it's going to add a lot more just like sunniness to the yeah. whole holiday. And I know like if anything that we are in need of right now, it's a lot more bright and sunniness in our life. So. Just wanted to say that. I agree. Well said. I have nothing to add. <laughs> um, buy all the wine and buy all the produce. And remember, you can order caviar and all these great things online if you need to. And you're stuck in Ohio without persimmons and kumquats. I love you, Ohio. Rondell Nance and <laughs> I love my Buckeyes. My parents met at Ohio State. So that's oh, why. That's very cute. Um, well, we great. So do we, do we need to do a recap or is everybody good on what we, we served? Yeah. Everybody's, I just want to make sure. Yeah. I, think I don't know if you do a recap. Sorry. <laughs> no, you crushed it. You brought, you brought the game. You brought the fire as always a wonderful job on item only cabin songs and um, these recipes again, like they look complicated and decadent, but they are not, um, you know, a little bit of effort, but not, you know, a ton. Like I literally made this today. I went shopping today and made it. It was like, not a big deal. I had like took several phone calls while like moving things in and out of the oven. It was fine. I promise you have the time. Um, so the things that we drank today, just to remind everyone, we have the uh, 2012 Crashioli uh, sparkling wine from Santa Lucia Highlands. Then we moved into the Desperada Sauvignon Blanc, um, which is very delicious and bright, uh, but textural and paired beautifully with that scallop crudo. And then we finished with this gorgeous 2015 or 2017 uh, Pei La Bruma Syrah from Sonoma Coast um, to go with our chicken shawarma. And all of these recipes, where can they find them? Oh yeah, they're at saltandwind.com. So um, yeah, and if you um, sign up for our newsletter, we share a, a new recipe every week. Um, but honestly, uh, uh, everything's got a California slant to it. So if that's your jam, then come hang out with us at Salt and Wind. And if not, I'm sorry. Maybe you should come visit me and I'll cook for you. And then you'll, I'll change your mind, hopefully. I don't know. I think so. <laughs> Thanks for yeah. having me, Amanda, though. It's oh always so lovely speaking no. with you. I always learn so much. I'm like, I feel like I'm studying to know my wine. And then Amanda just brings it. And you just get me so excited about nerding out about wine. So thank you for that. Well, the feeling is mutual back at you on the food front because I'm learning so much. I learned so much about caviar today. And I feel like I'm going to have to start my journey on becoming a certified caviar specialist. Um, mm. I think that has to be a thing, although I don't know if I have that kind of money to start the education. Um, but yeah, so we had uh, Zardicolai Caviar, uh, those three wines, recipes on salt and wind, and we will be, um, the two of us will be back tomorrow. Usually I'm like, I'll be on IG Live with Aida Mullen Camp, you've, you've not met here. Um, now you've heard she's here, you get to see us do this all again. Uh, tomorrow on, uh, on IG Live, she'll be taking over California Grown's channel, I'll be taking over California Wines channel, it'll be Friday, it'll be fun. Um, maybe we'll, you know, have some other treats, who knows, um, maybe we'll have new news in, in the, in the world. Who knows that either? I have no idea. Um, yeah. either it's way, supposed to snow where I am. So I'll let you yeah. know. Yeah. All, all kinds of things are happening. Tomorrow is a brand new day and we don't know what's going to happen between then and now. But what I do know is I'm saving these wines for tomorrow. So I will see you all there with these. I think that's super wise. I will save these wines as well. And, um, oh yeah, do get yourself a Bouchon this year. If you don't have a Bouchon, a Bouchon is that thing that, do you have one right there? You I think do I do. I think I do. Hold on a um, second. That thing that will save your second wine if you don't put down a whole bottle and you didn't so, buy it for yourself. Um, Amanda, do you have a preference on which one you like? I do, and not, uh, not all you of like the size fits all, although the one in your left hand, um, yep, that one tends to be the one that will fit on most bottles. 
Yes, um, and this tends to fit. Yeah, you're right. That's true. This doesn't fit on every single bottle. Yes. So the so, little shelves um, that will save you, and you know they're like five bucks on Amazon. Well worth grabbing this holiday season if you don't have one already. Um, and yeah, then I pour it in the rest, uh, which is you know one of those handy devices. I was just I was just about to ask you that. So okay, so you pour yeah. it in, and uh, okay, pour it in. good. Thank you. You you see, <laughs> she anticipates my questions before they even come out of my mouth. You're a, you're yeah. a mind, wide mind reader. I love it. Yes. Yeah. They haven't figured out the sparkling one in the Corvin front, but everything else is fair game. Um, so yeah. So I'll see you tomorrow, and then I'll be back here next Thursday, same time, same place, and we will be talking a little bit more uh, in the dairy section of the grocery store, um, which I'm sure you can probably guess what that means. Uh, we're talking all things wine and cheese, which means I'll be having cheese for dinner next Thursday. <laughs> well, so, thank you. Thank you. I'll see you next week. Or actually, I'll see you tomorrow. I'm sorry. I don't okay, know yeah. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Um, and uh, I'll see you guys hopefully tomorrow and next week. So um, thank you all for watching and uh, see y'all soon. Bye.